so this afternoon with you, I'd like to do the same thing virtually, not touring battlefields, but talking about battles and uh, specifically the question of why battles in the American Civil War were not decisive. Uh, and to to establish the, the baseline that, that these battles didn't uh, didn't win the war in a single afternoon, of course, we all know that's the case. Uh, let's start with a tip with a typical battle, and let me ask you. Uh, and I guess you can type into the chat window. Uh, name a battle, any major battle of the Civil War, and we'll start with that one. Uh, and so, uh, first come, first serve. And I'm seeing a few people have uh, written amusing things already in the chat window. But if anyone else wants to chip in, uh, let's start with a battle name. There we go. Chancellorsville is up first. Uh, Chancellorsville, a battle where the attacking side has a brilliant plan. Uh, Lee's and Jackson come up with the flank march on May 2nd, 1863. Jackson takes his troops around to the south and the west and north again and comes up behind the Union Army of the Potomac. And he smashes the federal line. The 11th Corps reels back in confusion. Uh, they go forward, but before they can get any, just when it seems like they are going to achieve a decisive victory, uh, bad luck befalls them. Jackson is wounded, and the Federals reorganize and make a stand, and they're able to hold their position the next day. The battle's indecisive. Uh, what else is up? Antietam. Uh, the attackers have a brilliant plan to attack. Hooker will attack on one flank, Burnside on the other. Uh, the attack goes forward. Hooker's men suffer incredible casualties in the cornfield uh, and are eventually driven back. So in turn are, are Mansfield's 12th Corps and then Sumner's 2nd Corps. But eventually, uh, Burnside does get across the bridge and absolute and decisive victory is within the grasp of the winning, the attacking side. When at the last moment, a defending unit makes a decisive stand, AP Hill's division shows up from Harper's Ferry, just uh, outside of Sharpsburg, they make a stand and the battle turns out not to be decisive. Uh, well, one more, Gettysburg. Uh, the attacking army has a brilliant plan. Uh, Longstreet will crushed the Union flank, made more vulnerable by Dan Sickles, extending Third Corps out into the Peach Orchard. Uh, and the Third third Corps crumples as if made of, of tin foil. It falls back across Little Round Top. But there again, just when decisive victory is within grasp, a defending unit makes uh, an incredibly brave stand. This time it's the 20th Maine on Little Round Top and the attack is blunted and it falls short of decisive victory. Um, at this point, ho hopefully the, the message is clear. There's a pattern in every major civil war battle with, with one or two exceptions, perhaps to prove the rule, one or two outliers. The attacking force will have initial success, will break the defender's line, will threaten the rear area will seem to have uh, absolute victory in its grasp. But then, uh, what, whatever the battle may be, let's see if we can uh, push the slide along here. There we go. Um, whether it's Manassas, as, as we see in, in the illustration now, where uh, the Union forces have victory within their grasp. Stonewall Jackson makes a stand uh, on, on Henry Hill, standing like a stone wall. In every battle, there's this heroic stand that snatches decisive victory out of the hands of the attacking force at the last moment. If that happens once, it's a great story. And if it happens twice, it's a coincidence. But if it happens again and again, on Henry Hill or on Little Round Top or George Thomas at Chickamauga uh, or the Round Forest at uh, Stones River or the Hornet's Nest at Shiloh. Uh, if again and again, a defensive stand blunts the attack and takes away decisive victory, at some point, the historian has to ask what's going on here. This is not a coincidence. This is a system. This is 
not an outlier. This is how all the battles work out. And indeed, if we look at the numbers uh, of battles, there we go. Uh, the slide now gives us a list of 49 major battles. It's written in intentionally tiny type, so you don't have the opportunity to read it, not necessary to do so. Uh, but just to get the general point that in most of the major battles, the attacker is defeated or the result is inconclusive. And if, if we alter the numbers a little bit to, to delete the Union victories at the tail end of the war at the bottom of the list, the numbers become even more lopsided. Uh, Civil war attacks ultimately fail. They, they, they run into uh, some kind of defensive stand that they can't overcome. So why is this? The traditional explanation, the one that we all read in Bruce Catton many years ago and subsequently through the 1960s, 70s, 80s, uh, up to the 1990s is that civil war battles saw a combination of modern weapons, specifically the rifled musket with its range much longer than that of the smoothbore, combined with Napoleonic tactics. Tactics hadn't caught up to technology, and that explains why attacks ultimately are unsuccessful. That explanation, however, dates back to a generation for which World War II was the, the, the archetype of, a, of a, a modern war. World War II is a war in which the invention of new technology leads to the invention of new tactics in a cycle back and forth. And when the tactics don't catch up to the technology, uh, defeat results. So we see in that war, uh, that cycle of technology and tactics being repeated over and over. Here's that traditional view of what causes the, uh, the defeat of the, the attackers. Some of you may recognize this uh, two-page spread on the screen is coming from the book, Arms and Equipment of the Civil War by Jack Coggins. I grew up uh, loving this book as, as a child in the 1960s. The book dates from the centennial of the Civil War era. And the illustration at the top shows a smooth bore hitting its target at 50 yards bothering its target at 100 yards. In contrast, the top of the right-hand page at 300 yards, the rifle is still accurate, uh, even out as far as 750 yards. That's a stretch, but uh, gives the idea. So there's your traditional explanation. But as, as suggested, it comes from a war, from a generation that remembers a war when tactics and technology were tightly intertwined, uh, so that you have examples like uh, the U-boat war in the Atlantic, the allies come up with radar in their airplanes to detect uh, where the U-boats are when they're on the surface, and there are losses among U-boats. And then the U-boats come up with uh, radar detectors seen on the, the right side of the screen that can detect uh, when the radar is coming. And back and forth, you see this cycle of invention, what Churchill called the wizard war, back and forth, uh, one side gaining the upper hand than the other. The cycle often took just a few months for one side to counter the other side's innovation. Uh, if we go backward in, in history to the First World War, we see it took four years before armored vehicles uh, it came up with a new technology to deal with the tactics of, of trench warfare. There's, there's a four-year action-reaction cycle. Or if we go forward in time uh, to the 21st century, uh, we see, uh, there we go, uh, to September 11th, 2001, uh, the terrorists who attacked the Twin Towers came up with a new technology using jet airliners as cruise missiles. Uh, and it took 30 minutes for the defenders to come up with a, a counter uh, in the form of Flight 93 and the passengers and crew uh, overcoming the attackers at the cost of their own lives, uh, unfortunately, but making the fourth, of the, the fourth of the four planes that were to attack that day unsuccessful 
uh, because the defenders immediately recognized what was going on and came up with a counter tactic for it. So you have this cycle back and forth, tactics and technology in the 20th century into the 21st century. I would argue that you don't have that in the American Civil War, that the rifle musket is not the reason why attacks were unsuccessful. There are a number of reasons uh, that I think support this argument. That uh, the facts are correct, certainly. The smoothbore musket does have uh, a, a deadly range, uh, certainly of 100 yards, but at that distance, it's very difficult to accurately hit a target with a smoothbore musket. Grant famously wrote, uh, the person could shoot at you all day at 200 yards with buck and ball ammunition from a smoothbore musket uh, without your finding out about it. But even though the rifled musket is more accurate, let's look at how they are used in the Civil War. For one thing, many units did not have the rifle musket in 1862. Here we see the, the bloody pond at Shiloh. Uh, in that battle, most of the units on both sides fought with the traditional smoothbore weapon. They did not yet have the rifled musket. As late as 1863, many units, uh, even in the Eastern theater, did not have the rifled musket. And yet the battles showed the same pattern. There's no discernible difference in the structure of battles between 1862 and 1864 in terms of attacker success. So the defenders are able to achieve the results of 1864 with the short range weapons that they had in 1862. That's one reason why I think the argument uh, doesn't necessarily hold up. Another one is that the advantage of a long range weapon, a weapon that can hit a target at 300 yards, is vitiated by the terrain in which the battles are fought. Here at the Bloody Pond, uh, this is a modern photograph where the Park Service has landscaped the terrain somewhat, uh, we can't see more than 150 yards away, just uh, at the very edge of smooth bore range. A rifled musket is not particularly advantageous if you can't see your target uh, at, at any range greater than a smoothbore can hit. Here's a photograph that I took uh, on a recent tour uh, of the wilderness, uh, the scene of battles in 1864 and also the Chancellorsville battle in 1863. Now I say that this is a photograph of the Virginia wilderness. It may actually be a photograph uh, of terrain in a public park in Greenville, North Carolina, where I live. I'm not sure. Uh, actually, I'm pretty sure this is a legitimate wilderness photograph, but it wouldn't matter. It's any typical American second growth forest. Uh, you can get the same effect going into such a forest anywhere. You can't see a target at 300 yards. You can not see a target at 100 yards. A smooth bore fires a flat trajectory shot over the first 50 yards, much as a rifled musket does. And that's all your weapon can accomplish in terrain like this. So you've got the fact that units don't have the rifled musket throughout the war, yet the battles remain the same. You've got terrain in which the full range of the rifled musket cannot be employed in many, many cases, and yet the battle outcomes remain the same. And then finally, you've got the fact that when there was open terrain, when there was the opportunity uh, and troops had the rifled muskets, still they did not fire them at the full range that was available. This illustration of Pickett's charge uh, shown from the Confederate perspective shows the troops advancing toward Cemetery Ridge at Gettysburg. Accounts show from the official records that when the Confederates made that charge, they reached the Emmitsburg Road just 220 yards from the federal line. And still many of the federal units had not opened fire. Artillery fire, yes, but not musket fire. Not until the rebels crossed the road and begin advancing up the slope. Uh, as one witness said, the, the defenders decided that the attackers could advance this far and no farther. And then they opened fire 
and, and stagger the Confederate lines with their volley. You can find this if you read the official records of any Civil War battle, practically. Officers will describe how even when they had open terrain and the ability to start shooting at 300 yards, they didn't do so. They considered that throwing away their fire, wasting ammunition. The first volley was the one with the most impact, the most discipline, the, the most noise and smoke to intimidate, as well as the most deadly effect. So that the, the small unit commander would want to reserve that volley to where it could do the most good. And that meant not shooting at three, four, 500 yards, but waiting till the enemy was within under 200 yards uh, and often 100 yards, which gets us back into smooth war musket range. The final reason, the fourth reason why battles are not determined by the long range of the rifled musket uh, or that uh, decisive attacks were made impossible by the rifled musket is the fact that some decisive attacks did occur. Uh, the Battle of Nashville in December 1864 is an example of a decisive battlefield victory. It's the lone outlying example of, in the Civil War where a field army is essentially destroyed on the field of battle or in the pursuit immediately afterward. Uh, Hood's army is depleted and demoralized when Thomas attacks him. Uh, at Nashville, and when that battle and the following pursuit is over with, Hood's army has effectively ceased to exist. So it is possible to have a decisive battle with against an enemy armed with smooth or armed with rifles, and even more so, we see this five years later, uh, six years later. We'll skip over that. Uh, well, there's there's. Uh, now let's go back. Um, we see that in the Franco-Prussian War. In 1870 and 1871, the Prussians do achieve decisive results against an enemy not armed with just the Civil War rifled musket, but with the Fren French uh, Chassepot, uh, a superior breech-loading rifle. And yet the Prussians are able to achieve decisive battlefield results more than once. So long range small arms are not why attacks cannot be decisive, why we cannot have a Waterloo in Kentucky, uh, as we see an illustration of Waterloo at Waterloo here. So this brings us to the question of the day, in that case, why no decisive battles in the American Civil War, if it's not due to the traditional answer that the long range weapon was mixed with traditional short range tactics. I would suggest one way to approach that is to say it's really the wrong question to ask. Uh, why no decisive battles? Perhaps a better question would be, why does anyone expect there to be a decisive battle? We see Waterloo as the, uh, the model of decisive battle in the 19th century, but Russell Wigley in his, his book, The Age of Battles, uh, several decades ago, pointed out that decisive battles in Napoleon's time and Frederick's time were still the outliers, were still rare and unusual, that most battles did not conclude with the defeated army completely routed and unable to recover and fight again. Uh, so there is that. But there were some decisive battles. So let's get back to the specific question, why none in the American Civil War? How did decisive battles occur when they did happen, when Napoleon, for example, is defeated, or when Napoleon and his marshals achieved victories that ended wars at uh, Auerstadt and Jena at Austerlitz. Uh, how did the Prussians in, in 1870 achieve these results? They did it in part by having armies that were fully trained, uh, and more important, by having leadership cadres, Napoleon's marshals, who understood what he intended to do and were able to carry out his wishes uh, without necessarily having them explained in detail. The army acted as a whole, as an organism, uh, led by a 
leader with a particular military genius at its head, uh, whether that be Napoleon or, or Frederick. And their intent was communicated almost organically to the people leading uh, their, their core, their divisions, uh, without necessarily being told they understood what was going to happen. Uh, in, 18, uh, in the 1870s, the Prussians achieved the same effect, not necessarily with genius among the generals at the top, but with a system of education that gave every officer uh, similar training so that every commander down to the regimental level understood what the staff solution was to a given military problem. And thus the army acted as a single organic body with officers and small units uh, coordinating one with another, not necessarily by being in communication, but by, uh, by following the, the doctrine of the army that had been inculcated through uh, a staff system that made the, the whole army into a single hive mind uh, where people, where, where officers knew what was expected of them uh, and could count on their fellow officers to behave in certain ways. American Civil War armies, in contrast, are, are uniquely suited to do just the opposite of these Napoleonic or uh, 1870 era Prussian armies. They are, first of all, they are untrained armies at the soldier level, at the, the non-commissioned officer level, at the field officer level, and then even in some cases, uh, the general officers do not have military training. Uh, if they have military training, it's not consistent military training. The U.S. Constitution has provisions that uh, Congress shall provide the method of instruction for militia in the various states because George Washington and the other veterans of the American Revolution were concerned that if each state trained its own militia in its own style, the U.S. might go to war with originally 13 different armies using 13 different sets of tactics. Uh, today, there'd be 50 of them. So they made that a federal responsibility, not a state responsibility. Nonetheless, the Civil War is fought by state volunteer regiments. And while most units use common sets of tactics, Hardy's tactics or Scott's tactics to train their men, still there's no guaranteed uniformity. And there's not much time. The troops go from being civilians in uniform to being uh, thrown into battle very, very quickly. So the men themselves are not uh, especially well-trained. The officers, until you get to the level of the generals, are almost certainly not trained at West Point. They're not professional soldiers. And even those who are trained there are not trained in the, the staff system that the Prussians use. The officers don't rotate between field and staff positions. West Point spends very little time in military training, military tactics. It's more of an engineering school. So you don't have an officer corps where every soldier is imbued with the same set of values and tactical precepts, which cause them to come to the same conclusion when faced with a given tactical problem. Uh, they don't have that, that intuitive communication with their neighboring brigade because they both see the same situation and come to the same uh, answer. That's not the case in the American Civil War. To the extent the generals did go to West Point, this leads to the fact that it's very difficult for them to surprise one another. Unlike uh, the Prussians against the French in 1870 or Napoleon against his enemies, we don't see one innovative force bringing a new way of war against uh, a traditional force. Instead, we see two armies whose leadership uh, thinks the same way on both sides. And thus, it's uh, very difficult to achieve surprise. We do see the occasional exception. Lee Chancellorsville, Jackson's flank march would be an example. But typically, uh, 
the two armies in any battle will be led by two officers who have similar conceptions. And thus we see the, the phenomenon of things like uh, at both Bull Run or Stones River, both sides attempt to attack the other's left flank. And if they start simultaneously, they would wheel around and capture each other's positions. Uh, that m may seem to counter, uh, to contradict the argument that we don't have a common staff system uh, and officers don't don't think alike. But then this, I'm saying this is happening only at the highest levels, the, the West Point trained generals. It's among the division brigade regiment commanders that we don't have in the civil American Civil War, the common base of tactical knowledge and training that leads them to, to think alike and act alike. And finally, to yet one more reason why the armies are unable to deal decisive blows to one another is the fact that the armies have exceeded the communications technology boundaries of their time. With the development of the railroad, armies can be supplied in place without having to travel around and forage. They can now stay in place and have supplies brought to them on a scale that Napoleon could only imagine. Uh, he could lead a million men into Russia in 1812, uh, but they had to keep moving uh, to, to forage to stay alive. In 1861 to 1865, an army with a rail supply line can have uh, wagon load after wagon load of supplies brought in, and the armies can reach a size uh, far too big to be effectively commanded by one person using just their voice and uh, messages delivered by courier. The telegraph is invented by this time, and telegraphs can be used. Uh, to help coordinate large bodies of troops, but they are not yet tactical, uh, available tactically. Only at the very end of the Civil War do we see federal troops starting to deploy uh, telegraph lines between units in tactical scenarios uh, on the battlefield. That really comes up only in the end of 1864. Throughout the war, for the most part, you have a case where the technology of logistics has allowed the armies to expand beyond the technology of communication so that one officer can hardly tell uh, what's happening at either flank of his army. Uh, two days ago, I was at Fredericksburg. We were looking at the site of Burnside's futile charges up Murray's Heights. And Burnside himself, uh, and, and the we were all marveling at why Burnside didn't go around that position. Of course, the answer is he tried to do so. Meade's division broke through Stonewall Jackson's position on Prospect Hill, several miles south of the main battle. But Burnside didn't exploit that. And after the battle, he said, I, I confess I didn't pay enough attention to that end of the battlefield. In other words, the battlefield was too big for an individual to manage uh, with nothing but the occasional paper message coming in from a courier. So the armies cannot deal decisive blows to one another, yet they can deal very painful blows. And this leads to the final point as to why these battles end up being indecisive. Even when the armies do launch these deadly attacks that smash the enemy uh, defenses cause brigades and regiments to to retreat to run away. They don't destroy the enemy units that they are attacking. These civilians in uniform that we saw a moment ago being trained, uh, they may have minimal training. They may not be able to execute complex maneuvers on the battlefield, but they have incredibly high small unit cohesion. These men who volunteered to fight the war, North and South, are locally raised. They are units of friends, of cousins, of brothers, of neighbors. They know one another. And thus, when they get into battle, even if they have almost no training at all, they do have bonds that modern armies strive to inculcate among their small units that, that may take months or years to instill. These men have those bonds ready-made. When they find themselves on the battlefield in a tight place, each one of 
them may want individually to run away, but he looks to the right and left and says, there's my neighbor and there's my brother-in-law. I can't leave. I can't run. Uh, I can't disgrace myself in front of these people. Where would I go to? I can't, I, I can't, if I were to leave the battle line today, I could never go home again. Uh, my neighbors, my family would, would shun me as a coward. I'd never be able to get a job. I'd never be able to find uh, someone to marry me. I'd never be able to, I'd be better off staying here and getting shot. They may not go through all those thoughts one by one, but as long as the neighbor is standing next to you, you stay in place. And so these units, instead of running away when they're in a tight spot, just stand there and take the most astonishing levels of casualties. We know the light brigade at Balaclava suffered 37% casualties and, and regard that as a unit wiped out. And by European standards, they were. But in Fox's Regimental Losses book, he details, I think there are some 60 federal regiments that suffered casualties of 50% or more in a single engagement. These numbers are unthinkable to professional soldiers. Professionals would know when they're whipped and it's time to run. But these green troops on both sides don't know that it's okay uh, as soldiers to give up at some point and they stand there and they die in place. So it's very difficult to disrupt a small unit in the Civil War without killing practically everyone in it. You've also got a very high level of motivation ideologically. You've got soldiers on both sides that deeply believe in the causes for which they are fighting. Uh, these are, until 1864, not conscripts. Uh, they are not joining for uh, the money. They, they deeply believe in the cause of freedom and union. If they're from the North, they deeply believe in defending their homeland and their way of life and the racial hierarchy in which they were raised, if they are from the South. And they're not going to, to yield that. So the regiments are incredibly cohesive. When, when the flag, wherever the regimental flag is, that's where the troops will be found. If the flag is not retreating, the men will not retreat. Uh, if it is going forward, they will go forward with it. And if they do have to retreat, uh, they will quickly rally around the flag, not just the title of a song, but a, a, a tactic that they would use and resume as a skeleton if organization, if necessary, their existence as a regiment. So the armies of the Civil War, uh, thus after every massive defeat, spring back to life. The Army of the Potomac is defeated by Lee again and again in 1862 into 1863, but each time it falls back and its component small units, its component regiments are still whole, even if they're badly depleted. And the Army resumes its form and campaigns again. The Army of Tennessee in, in the Western Theater, the Confederate Army of Tennessee does the same thing. By 1864, the Army of Northern Virginia's regiments are down to the size of mere companies, but they have not lost their internal cohesion. The men are still together and will continue to fight. So you've got armies that lack the ability at the highest levels to execute decisive maneuvers, and at the lowest level, the unwillingness to admit that they have ever suffered a decisive defeat, to ever give up. Uh, their cohesion and their unity. The problem of achieving decisive battle thus would not be solved during the Civil War. It would continue to plague armies uh, into the First World War uh, when, uh, here we see some of those casualties talked about a moment ago, the, the incredibly high human cost of the Civil War. These men would not give up. Uh, uh, the problem would not be solved for, for decades to come. Eventually, we would see uh, uh, new technologies developed to deal with this trench warfare that we first see in the American Civil War at, at Petersburg. Uh, we would see uh, wireless communication come to solve the problem of battlefield communication. Uh, 
we would see new technologies going back and forth, rapid fire artillery and machine guns. Uh, but all this is another story. Uh, going back to the Civil War to conclude, uh, it is not the technology of the time, uh, not the in the form of a rifled musket, the longer range of the rifled musket that makes these battles indecisive, but the size of the armies supported by the technology of the railroad. It is the inexperience and uh, like-minded thinking of the highest generals, the inability of those generals to communicate uh, to their units, and then at the lowest levels, the cohesion of the men who will follow their flag, who will stay together, uh, who will rally around the flag, no matter how high the casualties because they are units of brothers and cousins and they simply will not give up the battlefield. That's what keeps them together. Uh, that and not the rifled musket are why there was no Waterloo in Kentucky and why American Civil War battles were not decisive. <laughs>